Hey YouTube, Ed here with Jack of All Trades and welcome to another video. So today we are going to talk about the Gunstock War Club. I quite obviously made this one. We're going to go over a little brief history of the Gunstock War Club and then I'm going to show you how I made this particular one. So let's stop talking and let's get right into the video. And welcome back. So as per the usual, before we get going, I got to ask you to go down and hit that like and subscribe button down below. Make sure you ring that notification bell so you get notified of upcoming videos and hit me with those comments. If there's anything you'd like to see me do on this channel or any projects that you want to see me try to accomplish, let me know in those comments and I will certainly try to get them done. I don't ever ask you for money. I don't have a Patreon account. I only ask that you go down and hit that like and subscribe button. Okay, the Gunstock War Club. This is a very interesting weapon, and the history of it is fairly interesting. And if you've ever seen the uh, 1992 epic movie, uh, Last of the Mohicans, you'll see that this weapon gets used quite a lot in that movie. And they do some pretty accurate representations of how the weapon was used. But I just always found this thing really interesting, and so I decided one day that I was just going to up and make one, and I did so, and we're going to do this video. But before we get into uh, that, let's go ahead and let's discuss a really brief history of the Gunstock War Club. So the Gunstock War Club was an indigenous weapon used by many Native American people circa 18th and 19th century. And it is so named for its familiar appearance to that of a wooden gunstock from muskets and rifles of the time. Gunstock clubs were most largely used by the Eastern Woodland and Central and Northern Plains tribes as a bludgeoning weapon. And it was a very, very formidable weapon in the hands of a skilled user. The club was either swung or thrown and can be used to strike as well as block attacks. Although known to mostly be used by First Nation tribes of the northeastern United States and Canada, they were also known to be wielded by some of the northern plains tribes such as the Lakota and Sioux people. Details of its origins are still somewhat of a mystery and there's some controversy over that. However, there are basically four theories as to how the weapon came to be. Some claim that the design was based upon the shape of European firearms. Once the shot was spent on a musket or rifle, the firearm could be easily used as a stabbing weapon if it was affixed with a bayonet, or could be used as a blunt force weapon in close quarter combat. The indigenous people fighting with or against European soldiers saw these techniques and not being strangers to bludgeoning weapons themselves, took a liking to the design and began to fashion clubs of a similar shape. Still others contend that the indigenous people in possession of muskets or rifles later modified them into club weapons when they experienced a mechanical failure and they could not be repaired. However, the extensive inletting of the wood to accommodate the barrel and the mechanism of the firearm substantially weakens the wood stock and they would not hold up to repeated usage as a club. Therefore, the tribes began to fashion clubs out of, of similar shape, minus the inletting, which gave the club much better strength. A third theory, and the one that I frankly find the most plausible, is that muskets and rifles simply provided the inspiration for the design. Warriors may have been possibly trying to take advantage of the fear created by muskets and rifles by fashioning clubs of a similar design. Carrying these clubs, which looked a lot like firearms, tribes might have been trying to gain a psychological advantage over their rivals in battle. A final theory advocated by several Native American cultural historians contend that the Gunstock Club was simply an accident of design developed separately even before the arrival of the Europeans. Whichever theory you subscribe to, the fact is, is that the Gunstock War Club was a very real weapon and were very formidable on the battlefield. Indigenous warriors frequently used blood force trauma weapons like the ball head club and the tomahawk, and the gunstock war club had a significant presence in tribal warfare as well, usually made of straight-grained hardwoods like maple, ash, oak, or hickory, depending on the region of use, and averaging anywhere from 24 to 36 inches in length, with few exceptions being a little longer. Typically, the club weighed 2 to 3 pounds, and the striking energy being focused onto the leading edge or the trailing edge of the club, the Gunstock War Club could hit with astonishing power. 
The deadliness of the club was further enhanced by the addition of a sharp protrusion positioned in the vicinity of the club's elbow. These penetrating protrusions were typically fashioned from flint, horn, or stone in the beginning. However, forged iron blades, steel knives, and spear points were certainly used later on. One reference I found stated that an excavated gunstock war club was fitted with a butcher knife blade that wore the maker's mark of a European knife maker. These clubs were also often decorated with brass tacks or other adornments, and the wood many times was carved with depictive designs. In current Native American society, gunstock war clubs are still used as regalia in formal settings. The gunstock war club is also a primary weapon for practitioners of Okichita, which is short for Ekichitarawak, which means of worthy men. Okichita is a stylized fighting discipline or martial art founded on the fighting techniques of the Plains Cree people and is still taught to this day, most notably by Master George Lapine of Toronto, Ontario. I will post links to the Okichita website and some of their YouTube videos in the description if you have further interest in that. All right, so why did I decide to build a Gunstock War Club? Well, I always was thought this was a fairly intriguing weapon. Uh, when I saw Last of the Mohicans in the movie theater in 1992, I, I was immediately enamored with uh, uh, Russell Means' character, Gene Gotchkook, and he carried a Gunstock War Club, although it was much larger than this one and much, much more formidable. Uh, but throughout the entire movie, you saw this style of war club being used on many occasions. And it was just always very interesting to me. And I, I, have, a, I have a bit of an interest in ancient style weapons. And I thought, you know what, that's actually fairly easy to make. So I'm just going to go ahead and make one. So let's go ahead and get right into the video on uh, how I made this club. Now, just for your own reference, if you want to make one of these yourself, this is a piece of 1x8 oak that I picked up at my local lumber yard. All the metal components I either had lying around or I also picked up at the same uh, local hardware store lumber yard. And as far as the leather, leather adornments and things of that effect, I picked those up at my local craft store. All right, so like I stated, I took my uh, piece of 1x8 oak here that I had and just it was covered in plastic. And I just right over the plastic took a Sharpie and I drew out the design of the stock and how I wanted it. Then I used a basic center punch. And I went and I marked through the plastic at everywhere that there was a corner or turn. So then when I had all those uh, transition points marked, when I peeled the plastic away, it was nothing more difficult than just go ahead and taking a, uh, a ruler and a pencil and connecting the dots. And then, uh, then I had a good line, a trace line on how I needed to go ahead and cut the piece out. It was very, very simple to do and it was the best, most effective way I could think of to transfer the design I was trying to achieve to the wood and ultimately getting the shape that I wanted. Then I just simply took my jigsaw, jigsaw and I jigsawed out the uh, pieces of material that needed to come off and that gave me my basic and uh, rough shape of the, of the club itself and how I basically wanted it to look. Then came out the files and the sandpaper and everything and I went ahead and I smoothed out all the corners and inside corners and transitions, uh, making everything as nice and smooth as I possibly could. Of course, I used my belt sander as often as I could uh, because I like using my belt sander. And I just basically cleaned up everything and got the shape just slightly more refined. Then I took a three quarter inch by one eighth inch thick piece of flat stock and I marked it and bent it to fit the spine of the gun, of the club uh, so that it would just give a little bit re more reinforcement. Now I just very simply marked the elbow, heated it up, put a good bend on it so that it would fit a little better and then of course I had to trim it to length because the uh, the flat stock was longer than the club itself. Then I went ahead and I went and marked uh, about every inch uh, where I wanted to drill a hole to put a screw in and screw the actual piece of flat bar to the uh, to the spine of the stock. So I just used a step drill. I just got punched through the, the steel flat bar. And then I went ahead and I took a uh, countersink and I countersunk them all. And then when I installed it onto the spine of the uh, club, I pre-drilled all of the holes so I didn't uh, have any problems with splitting the wood and screwed in one inch brass screws to affix it to the back of the wood. Uh, I didn't glue it or anything like that because I actually had to take it on and off a couple of times to uh, to do some various things. 
specifically when I had to go ahead and affix the protrusion point, which I'll show you here in just a little bit. But just go ahead and run in a bunch of one inch screws. And then I went ahead and I took my belt sander and I refined the shape of the stock a little bit more, got everything nice and rounded and feeling comfortable and good in my hand. And then it was time to go ahead and make the protrusion point. Now I quite simply just put a piece of 3 16 flat steel up against the stock, uh, drew the shape uh, the way it needed to be, cut out a tang on my bandsaw because it didn't need to be the full width. And then I had my point pretty much the way I wanted it. Then I took a piece of soapstone and I drew out the basic shape of the point. Again, cutting it off on my bandsaw and refining the shape even further on my belt sander. Uh, once I had the shape the way that I wanted it, it was just simply a matter of going back to the club, uh, marking the spots where the tang had to uh, get inserted into the club. And then I took my center punch and I center punched a series of holes along that uh, plane and went and drilled through the wood or through the steel into the wood where that tang needed to get inserted. Then I physically had to remove the, uh, the uh, steel and took a Dremel tool and I ground out the slot or cut out the slot where the tang was to be inserted. Then I took a file and cleaned up the edges a little bit better so that the tang fit in there. It doesn't need to be super clean because you're just covering it up anyway. Then I took a drill and I went ahead and I hogged out the slot where the tang was going to get inserted into the club itself. Uh, so it had plenty of room to accept the tang. Very, very simple, and it made a very nice fit. I was very happy with the result. As you can see here, it fits very nicely. Then I went ahead and I drilled a hole uh, through the club and through the tang itself, and this hole is going to accept the brass pin, uh, retaining pin. So then I went ahead and I just took and I step drilled it from, uh, took a small eighth inch bit, and then I moved it up to the size of the pin. Now you can use whatever size pin you want. This is just one I had laying around. So I just went with it and it worked out good for me. You can get these pins at Amazon and any, or any knife maker's supply. Then it was a matter of mixing up some two-part epoxy, getting follow the instructions of the epoxy, and then I literally poured it down into the, the void where the tang was going to go in, filling it about half full. And then I went ahead and I inserted the point making sure that I uh, let the epoxy come out the holes and then went ahead and installed the pin where it needed to be. And then it was a matter of letting it set up for a few hours. After it was set up, I went ahead and took some walnut stain and I went ahead and I had stained the stock uh, to the color that I wanted. I'm not a particular fan of the light oak color, so I stained it a little darker to my liking. Uh, very simple, this was Birchwood's Casey's Walnut Gunstock Stain. Uh, and then I put a couple of coats on to get at the darkness I wanted and then I took a torch and I basically scorched the grains of the stock itself or the, the club itself uh, to bring out that grain with a little darker pattern and I really like this effect and this look it really made the uh, the club look really nice when it was all when it was all said and done uh, I've done this before with pine and it works really well on oak as well then I went ahead and I just saturated the whole thing with uh, boiled linseed oil, making sure to get, uh, get good oil inside of the hole there for the, for the sling that I didn't show you how I drilled, but I figured you could figure that one out on your own, and just really covered it good in boiled linseed oil. I put three, four, five coats of linseed oil on this. And then I went and I took some uh, leather lacing to wrap the handle. Uh, you've seen me wrap these handles before when I made my deer jawbone tomahawk. Uh, just wrapped it the entire length of where I wanted the handle to be and that came out really really nice I was very pleased with that I love the way that looks and I really like the leather suede uh, lacing for handles and then it was a matter of taking that same boiled linseed oil and putting a very liberal amount of oil on the handle to penetrate all the way through the lacing down to the wood this kind of locks the lacing into place helps protect it from uh, age and elements and things of that effect and you really got to put a lot on because that lacing will really soak up the oil thoroughly and it, it really, really drinks it up because it's pretty dry and it's pretty thirsty. So don't be afraid to put a lot on. I had the bucket right underneath there and I let it drip out. Then I went ahead and I, uh, about every inch or so, I went and took an automatic center punch and I center punched uh, where I wanted to install my brass tacks for decoration. Uh, this was a very easy way of marking it and it just worked really, really well. Then I 
brass tacks that I got at my local uh, hardware store. I went ahead and I just pounded those in with a rubber mallet as to not deform them. Uh, these are the ones that have a little bit of texture and decoration on it, so they looked really nice once installed. And I was very happy that I went ahead and decided to do this, and it was a super easy way to, uh, to decorate the club and give it a little bit of uh, further eye appeal, if you will. I think I ended up with like 12 tacks on either side. Then once all that was said and done, I went ahead and took that same leather lacing and I wrapped it into the, the holes that I drilled to mount a sling, basically making a sling loop, if you will. Uh, four or five wraps of it to give it some good strength, trim off the excess, and I had myself a sling loop. Then it was a matter of taking an inch and a half piece of leather, uh, drilling a couple of holes in it, uh, large enough to accept some pop rivets that I intended to use to rivet the sling uh, sling into a loop to go around the leather lacing and then very simply used aluminum pop rivets with rivet backers to attach the sling to the sling loops. Very very simple process. It looked very nice and slightly modern but still gave the prop appropriate appearance. Uh, if you looked in the movie Mac Back to the Mohican uh, Chingachgook the character had a sling on his so that he could carry it along with his rifle and uh, I just thought a sling would be appropriate to go ahead and install a sling on the club would make it a little more functional and it also made it look nice. And there you have it, how I made my gunstock war club in a brief history on the weapon itself. Now if you find these kind of videos interesting, I really would appreciate you going down and smashing that like and subscribe button and letting me know your thoughts in the comments down below. I really do appreciate it. It certainly does make a big difference in helping out the channel and it's the only way I ever ask you for support is to hit that like and subscribe button. With that, this is Ed from Jack of All Trades. As always, thank you to my longtime subscribers. I really do appreciate your support. Thank you to everybody who's a new subscriber and all of those who watch those videos. And as always, we will see you on the next video.